Well, I think there's this consensus now among the Arab states that he's not going there, you know, uh, he's not going anywhere. So the uprising, you know, it's not complete, but it's been in a stalemate for a couple of years. The boundaries of the conflict are pretty stable. And he's he's the leader of Syria for the time being. They've sort of decided, well, we have to deal with him. Um, but there's also other issues that impact these states. One is the situation of all of the Syrian ref refugees living in bordering states, which is a huge political issue uh, in the region. Um, and the other which is something that the Assad regime excels at, and that is that it's created this enormous problem that it's the only one that can solve. And that's the Captagon trade. Captagon is a synthetic drug that's being produced in Syria by people close to the regime. Um, and the trade in this drug uh, is causing huge social harm in Saudi Arabia and Jordan in particular. And these countries hope that by bringing Assad to the table that he'll be able to help resolve the crisis, even though in many ways he's the one creating it. Indeed. So to that point, those two issues, Syrian refugees and that drug crisis, have there been conditions been placed on him coming back into the Arab League? Uh, well, I mean, Captagon has been a big focus of that and there have been, you know, there has been discussions, a lot of discussions around that, um, you know, and he has suggested that he's happy to help to resolve the crisis. Um, I'm not sure that he probably can either because uh, it is it is being produced by powerful people that are close to him and, uh, you know, who are making a lot of money out of it. Um, so I'm not sure that he really has any incentive to, to resolve the crisis, but certainly he is making the right signals to these countries. Mm. Having said that, you know, there are still many Syrians who are constantly under threat living in Syria. Um, this war is not necessarily over for a lot of the residents of Syria. Um, how, is, how is Syria going to be reunited uh, going forward? Look, I think uh, the Arab League uh, and a lot of the states in the Arab League have suggested that this is, uh, you know, the, the previous efforts at peace have failed and this is going to be our new strategy. We're going to pursue peace in Syria through, um, you know, the Arab League process and by inviting Assad back in. Um, and I think uh, Assad now, he's been invited, you know, he, he has um, survived this war. He has been through, um, you know, he's brutalized his own population. Um, and as far as he's concerned, he's now back on the international stage, um, you know, and is being rehabilitated. So I don't think Assad's going to see any significant need to make compromises or to resolve anything. So uh, I don't think it's going to have certainly a positive impact on, on the lives of those inside Syria. Yeah, which is just a tragedy. Uh, you know, many Arab states funded the opposition. Has this largely stopped? Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, the, the vast bulk of that has stopped now. I mean, the conflict has changed too. I mean, it's not in the sort of active conflict phase that it was um, when huge amounts of money were going in. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it cost a lot of money for a lot of these states, particularly Saudi Arabia, which is the state that is actually leading Assad's rehabilitation at the moment through the Arab League. Um, and I think a lot of these states got to the point where they felt that the uh, the opposition was not um, what not successful, was not doing what they wanted, um, and decided to to give up. Yeah. How united is his welcome back to the fold? I noticed that the uh, Qatar's Emir walked out when he spoke. Yeah, so there's been there's been quite a bit of disunity, uh, you know, in recent times. Morocco also was opposing. Uh, his uh, uh, Syria's return to the Arab League for a long time. It, it has come around. Um, but, yeah, Qatar is probably the only holdout. This is actually, this this hasn't come out of nowhere. You know, the UAE and Jordan over the last couple of years have been pursuing strong bilateral ties um, with the regime, again, with the argument that, you know, talking to him, working directly with him, you know, means we're going to be able to resolve the Syrian conflict. This has failed to bear fruit. They've, they've literally got nothing out of these discussions with him. Um, and now Saudi Arabia has decided to try it through the Arab League itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's accused, as, as, we, as you've talked about, of serious war crimes. He's now also been invited to COP28, the climate summit, summit in November. What sort of response do you think we're going to see from the international community? Well, I mean, the international community has been much stronger on this issue than regional parties. But I mean, in, in the defence of the regional states, the international community, for the most part, hasn't actually, um, you know, 
borne the brunt of the Syrian conflict. It hasn't. It's not still hosting millions of Syrian refugees with very little international support at the moment. For the most part, it's not dealing with Captagon trade. So, um, you know, the global community, I think, will give him a far cooler reaction uh, response. Um, but it, it, they're in a much easier position to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, what I will say is that I think 10 years ago, I never thought we'd see him back at the Arab League at all. And now he has, you know, he's a survivor. The world has shown there has no interest in seriously punish him for him, uh, punishing him for the way he's acted. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it must feel like a total slap in the face for, you know, those people against whom he committed such atrocities. And there was almost a smugness about him when he made his speech. Yeah, and I mean that's that. I mean that's what he's like. That it, that is his nature to act like that. Um, this is this is a really tough time on um, Syrian victims who who extend into the many millions. You know, more than half of Syrians were displaced as a result of the war. More than five hundred thousand people have been killed, predominantly by the regime. Um, and there's many millions of Syrians who are outside the country who do not want to go home to Assad-controlled Syria, who don't feel safe to do that. And at the same time, we've got vaults and vaults of evidence of regime war crimes just waiting to be prosecuted. You know, there's been successful prosecutions of regime officials in Germany. Uh, there's a court in France at the moment that's currently trying to senior officials for crimes against humanity. So there's very little dispute at the international or even at the legal level that Assad and his regime are war criminals. But the international community has, for the most part, failed to do anything about this, and it's failed victims, and it does every day. Yeah, uh, and much like uh, the, the, the international community is, you know, I guess some countries, and Arab, the Arab League again has been criticised by the Ukrainian president Zelensky for their sort of turning a blind eye to the Ukraine war. Um, why is the Arab League, in, in a way, not supporting Ukraine? I guess um, you know, Ukraine's complex for a lot of these um, these states. You know, Russia and the US have, have have complex relations and complex histories in that region, and that will be playing into this. But I thought actually Syria's response, Assad's response to Zelensky's speech was particularly interesting. He actually removed his translation headphones during the speech so that he didn't have to listen to him speak. Um, I mean, Assad has very much since 2015, uh, August, uh, sorry, September 2015, when Russia. Um, became fully militarily involved in Syria, you know, Assad has been very reliant on them. But I just thought that was really, really important um, to watch. Yeah, sort of, as you say, indicative of the man. Uh, Really good to talk, Dara. Thanks so much. Thank you for your time.